Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. It's the tenth day of Christmas, and instead of ten lords of leaping, it's a surprise seasonal episode. Just in time for Epiphany, we're talking about the Magi, or maybe we're talking about the Magi with Dr. Eric Van Den Eichel. Hello, Dr. Van Den Eichel. Thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I, I truly enjoyed your book, which we're going to be talking about, which is titled The Magi, or maybe The Magi, who they were, how they've been remembered, and why they still fascinate. Um, so everybody, go out and get this book. You're going to want to after listening to this interview. But but I'll get, I guess I should just start at the very beginning. Like, What inspired you to, to write this book in the first place? Oh, that's a question I get a lot. Um, I think really the the answer is um, a kind of combination of just you know intellectual curiosity and frustration, which I'll get to in a second, and also kind of postdoctoral studies um, boredom and trepidation. So right after my dissertation defense, I started kind of looking for another project, and and this project kind of grew a little bit naturally out of my dissertation, and. Um, but in the in the in the early stages of researching the Magi and uh, and I'll say Magi Magi you say Magi Magi whatever whatever works works for these guys. Um, but now I started I started doing a little bit of research on them and, and trying to figure out you know if there was any openings for uh, for a book uh, of of this sort and um, and really just kind of fascinated to find a kind of combination in the biblical studies literature of just really pretty um, milk toast kind of boring interpretations that I wasn't very satisfied with. Um, but then also um, a really, really interesting combination of like conspiracy theory stuff uh, that I found online and just all sorts of really, really weird material. And so really what inspired me to write this book was just um, you know, in my in my kind of research on these figures, I just found so much wild and crazy stuff. And I thought, you know, I'd love to be able to share that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what's what's this book about? Uh, this is this is a famous read, like leading question because I've read the book. But <laughs> is it is it quote unquote <laughs> the true history of the actual magi who were real people who visited the historical Jesus? Is is this is this what this book is? Uh, it, this is absolutely not what this book is. Um, so the the position that I take in this book, um, my own personal position is that I don't think the Magi actually existed. Um, but the position that I take in this book is that it doesn't matter. And also, I don't care. Um, and so, um, so I've had people um, who I've talked with about this, who've read this book, who uh, who very firmly and strongly believe in the historical Magi, and and you know, and they have been able to read this book and say. Um, you know, for the purposes of, of, of this book, it doesn't really matter whether they were real or not. Um, so my goal in this book is not to prove that they were uh, that they were real figures or to disprove that they were real figures or to figure out who they really were. Um, my goal in this book is to try to figure out who Matthew thought they were and to try to figure out why Matthew told their story in the way that he did and why he even bothered to really include it uh, at all. And then, um, and then after that, to sort of trace the development of them as literary characters through, um, you know, certain threads of the history of interpretation. And so really this book is about the Magi as literary characters rather than as historical characters. Right, right. And of course, for, for those familiar with the material, the, the Magi first appear in the book of Matthew. And also for, for a point of clarification, when you say Matthew, you don't mean the Apostle Matthew sat down and wrote this book. This is often shorthand for the unknown author of this text, right? Yeah, correct. So yeah, when, when biblical scholars use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, really we're, we're using these as, I mean, these are the traditional namings of these gospels, but um, most of the evidence points to the gospel of Matthew was originally um, anonymous. And so it was, it was originally just a, you know, a story. And then it was later then attributed to, you know, the gospel according to Matthew and then the other, the others as well. So when I say Matthew, you know, was the author's name Matthew? Maybe. Um, were they a disciple of Jesus? Probably not. Um, but, you know, we, we call them that for just a naming convention. Right. But and of course, if you if you have a faith belief that you believe that Matthew wrote it, I mean, we can't disprove that because we don't have a time machine. So, well, right. And that's one of the, you know, as the longer that I've done this, uh, this whole biblical studies thing, um, you know, one of the questions everyone's always very interested in is that question of historicity, right? Can like, can we prove this? Can we prove this? And really, the longer I've done this, the more I've come to realize that most of this stuff that we're talking about in terms of historicity, 
the historical Jesus, the historicity of any of these characters, um, a lot of it is is still just super hypothetical. And that's not to say that none of it actually happened. I happen to believe that Jesus actually did exist as a historical figure because there's evidence for it. But um, but yeah, in terms of proving, disproving, whatever, um, the historical strata in most of these cases is really, really, really shaky um, and and pretty pretty well hidden. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I completely uh, uh, concur. Um, so I like I really love the book, as I said at the top of the show, and, and I actually found it to be a great intro to like biblical studies, to New Testament studies, and in general, like it's great for a general audience. You you really break down uh, concepts that could be applied to other ways of, of studying the New Testament, of studying the Bible. Uh, it, it's written in very accessible language. Uh, you really connect it to the present day and why these figures matter for the twenty first century. But you know, I, I would say that it's also great for for even those who have PhDs in the field because I, I doubt that that a lot of scholars specialize in the field of magi studies. Um, so <laughs> right. what I'm leading up to is you know Christmas is still a huge force in our, our so-called secular culture. Do you feel like like the Christmas stories are are, are good in for introducing people to historical biblical studies? You know like what you teach in your day job. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, you know, I really, I, I think that they probably are. I haven't really thought about that um, the way that you've just framed it, but I think that I think that they probably are, uh, because the history, the, the 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 Christmas story, the traditional Christmas story, right, where Joseph and Mary are traveling from Nazareth and they travel to Bethlehem, and then Jesus is born, put in a manger, and then the and then the magi show up, and then the shepherds show up, and all of that. You know, that, that story doesn't exist in the New Testament. That story is a combination of Matthew and, and Luke. And so, um, and, if, and if any readers, or if, if any viewers are right now saying, wait, what? Uh, go, you know, Matthew, <laughs> Matthew too, uh, and then the start of Luke as well. Um, but um, no, I think, I think that, that these stories actually are a really good in, because we can take um, that traditional Christmas story, and we can talk about that as the product of how readers kind of understand texts and how they think about texts and how texts are, um, uh, are, are remembered and how they're adapted and how they change um, through the centuries. And, um, and then after we've kind of done that, then we can do the kind of comparative work of saying, okay, here's Matthew's story and here's Luke's story. And to sort of compare and contrast to say, you know, how how is Matthew telling his story and what is he aiming to accomplish through that? And then the same question with Luke, um, because these are really, really different stories. You know, in Matthew, Jesus is born in a house and he's visited by people who are bringing really expensive gifts. Maybe that says something about his status, um, social status. Maybe that says something about um, uh, about who who Matthew conceives or uh, you know conceives of him as a as a as a character, but then in Luke, right, Jesus is born essentially homeless. Uh, he's he's sleeping in a feeding trough and um, and not visited by people bringing expensive gifts. He's visited by the outcasts of society, the shepherds, and so you know they're kind of brought in and these people who are not bringing anything to him. But um, so yeah, two different, really really different stories, and I think then that can give you um, that can give you as you said an in into saying, you know, how are we as scholars thinking about these stories? Um, we're not thinking about this in terms of, well, what are the historical details that are correct? We're thinking about this in terms of what are these details doing and what are these details doing and how are these details doing different things? Exactly, exactly. So I, I keep saying Magi and, you know, I, I've been saying that that word since I was a little kid in Sunday school. And uh, what does that word mean anyway? Yeah, that's a great. Um, so Magi or um, a colleague of mine who who does uh, uh, magic in early Christianity um, pronounces it Magi. This is uh, Shaylee Patel who teaches up up the road at Virginia Tech. She says Magi. I say mag Magi or Magi. And in the Greek, it's either Magoi or Magoi. So <laughs> all sorts of different. That's that's why I really don't care about pronunciation. So um, in this book, I leave the the word Magi just as kind of an untranslated Magi. And um, in most English translations, it is translated either as uh, wise men, the, the really, really familiar wise men, or as um, in a couple as astrologers or something like this. The reason that I left it as, as magi in this book, and the reason I like to keep it as magi, is that I think that neither wise men nor astrologers really captures the full sense of 
of what that word means in the ancient world. Um, so it's certainly not a word that Matthew made up. It's a word that he is uh, that he is familiar with from other uh, stories or other other texts. And um, it's a book. It's it's a it's a word that I mean, if we think about um, you know magi and words that kind of resemble that word in English, the closest we come to is is magic, and and this is in fact where the word magic comes from and where the word magician comes from. So if we think about this as you know um, maybe just a good like wooden translation as magicians, um, but in the ancient world they're not just magicians because today when we think about you know if somebody is a magician, what that means is that they are somebody who does tricks um, or illusions if you're familiar with the rest of development maybe you're not let's just let it go but um uh but but in, but the, in the ancient world to call somebody a a magoi uh, or, a, or a magus is to uh is to really not just call them like a, i mean in some in some cases it does sort of have this sense of somebody who's doing tricks to kind of wow the crowds or whatever but there's sort of a sense that they're charlatans or fake or whatever um but really for the most part in the ancient world uh this title is referring to really respected professional um religious practitioners you know priests um visionaries people you know if you if you're a if you're a king and you have a bad dream um the person that you're going to call the people that you're going to call are the magoi and you're going to call them to to help so that they can help you figure out what your dream um kind of means or if there's you know some tree catches fire or whatever you're going to call the magoi to help understand why that happened and so um so yeah what is a magus um and when and when matthew uses this word he's tapping into that tradition of these respected kind of religious professionals and and really you know there's no simple answer for what a uh, for what a magus or a, ma a magi actually is um but i mean for matthew it, it it's sort of that the totality of that really really complicated identity um uh, yeah, and, and certainly um, uh, a complicated identity that's also very foreign and very exotic. I think that's sort of a, a sense of, of, of that he's using this as they, they've come from a long way away. Right, right. Um, and his, his audience would have been familiar with, with the term and they it would have had the, perhaps as, as many connotations for, for both him and for them, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, this would have been running through perhaps many of his readers and listeners' heads. Absolutely, and and really, um, one of the, and one of the points that I make in the book, which I think is an important one, um, you know, it it isn't the case, um, you know, when we read, you know, the wise men come to 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 to, to Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem, you know, that's sort of a, a nice positive kind of. Um, you know, warm and fuzzy, like, you know, they're traveling af from afar and all this kind of stuff. Um, if you look at the other, there's two other instances in the New Testament um, where, where Magi are, are, uh, Magi are spoken of, and that's in, in the book of Acts. And in both of these instances, their names are Simon and Bar-Jesus. And in both of these instances, the word is used as an insult. I mean, these are not like good, respectable characters. That author is saying, you know, these are these are dirty, rotten magi. Um, it, he doesn't seem to really use it as a, as a compliment at all, or even as a neutral um, descriptor. He's simply using it as an insult. And so, I think um, when Matthew is using this word, I don't think he's using it as an insult, but I think that he's very aware that it could be used negatively. I don't think there's any way that he couldn't be aware of that. Yeah, yeah, that's why when the author of, of Luke is uh, rewriting Matthew's uh, Christmas story, right, he he doesn't like Magi, and he wants to put in uh, uh, the shepherds instead. So, mm -hmm. uh, and he's also concerned with uh, with social status and uh, the concerns of the poor. Um, yep. uh, and because, you know, the, the author, the redactor of Luke is also the, the author of Acts. Anyways, okay, so uh, moving on. So the story is first told in Matthew, and you write about how it could be tied to ideas and a narrative about kingship and rightful kingship and uh, this is sort of a big question so it's one we could kind of break it down and, and unpack this a little bit so mm -hmm. so so king herod you know how did he become a ruler and, and why would some at the time have viewed him as illegitimate yeah so herod is one of these characters who um you know where we're talking about the historical strata of things we're pretty sure herod the great <laughs> exists as a, as a as a historical figure um so how does he become king and so without getting too much in the in the weeds of the um of this period because it is a very very weedy period a lot of uh, and a lot of what i'm going to say right now comes from the the jewish uh, the greek jewish historian uh, josephus 
Um, so Josephus uh, tells us that um, really Herod's kingship or Herod's leadership position um, comes to him not by virtue really of, uh, well, I guess sort of by virtue of birth, but really it comes to him because of his father. And so his father is a figure named Antipater I, and Antipater I is... Um, is appointed as the steward of Judea uh, by Julius Caesar himself. And so Julius Caesar, um, before his assassination, is um, um, appoints, uh, appoints um, uh, Antipater as, as, as steward of, of Judea. And this is a bit controversial because um, Antipater is not a Judean. Antipater is an Idumean. Idumea is a, is a region south of Judea. And so this is very much a sort of, you know, Caesar is, um, is, is saying here, you know, this is, this is the person that I want. I, as this, as this Roman leader, I want this person to be in charge of Judea. Um, but it's, in a sense, this is kind of a puppet, a puppet king um, relationship, right? Antipater is king, or uh, rather is steward of Judea, um, because presumably Antipater is going to do a good job of carrying out Caesar's will for Judea, right? And um, anyway, so after Antipater dies, then um, Herod, uh, Antipater's son, meets with uh, Caesar's son, Octavian, and Octavian then um, kind of bestows this position onto him as well. But then uh, Josephus says that Herod becomes the king of the Judeans, uh, not just the steward, but the king of the Judeans because the Roman Senate gave him that title. Mm -hmm. And so in the first century, uh, in the early, early first century um, uh, uh, CE, and also the, the late first century uh, BCE, you know, Herod sort of is, is, this, is this person, this king of the Judeans, but it's very well known that Herod is not king of the Judeans because he is a Judean. Herod is king of the Judeans because Rome wants him to be. And Rome wants him to be because he's good and docile and he does what Rome wants. And he and he also kind of, you know, he he does a good job of 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 buttering the 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 emperors up and you know building cities and building all of these kinds of things. And so Herod's kingship is, I think, for Matthew, an illegitimate kingship. And I think that the entire story of the Magi sort of um, is is meant as a polemic, not only against Herod, but against Rome, who gives him his power. Mm. Now, uh, you've said that the phrase King of the Judeans uh, a few times, yeah. and a lot of listeners, they might be confused because isn't the phrase King of the Jews? That's the way that most English translations um, are rendering it. So it's the the King of the Eudaioi is the Greek word. And, um, and Eudaioi is... Uh, it's a pretty, um, let's say, uh, in biblical studies, this is one of those controversial questions, right? And so, like, how do you translate Eudaioi? Do you translate it as Jews or do you translate it as Judeans? Um, so the let me start with just kind of the 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 argument for translating it as uh, as Judeans, um, which I have done throughout this book. Um, so. Translating it as Judean, as Judeans, um, really just, I mean, at, on a very, very literal level, that's just what it means. Judah um, is, is, is Judah or Judea. And so um, uh, Eudaioi is uh, our people who are from Judea or who have ties to Judea. And the reason why I translated it as Judea, Judeans here, and the reason why I think that, um, that here it's, it's appropriate is because in the ancient world, when we're talking about um, ethnic groups, ethnoi, when we're talking about ethno ethnoi, we are always talking about people who are identifying themselves in relation to uh, to a location. So if you ask somebody, you know, what are you? And they say, I'm an Egyptian. Well, I mean, that 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 kind of, you know, it ties them to us to a location. It ties them to a people. It ties them to religious practice. Uh, philosophical ideals, all of these sorts of things. And so we tend to see this, right? Well, you know, Romans, Egyptians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Judeans. And so there's a, there's a sense here that by translating Eudaioi as Judeans, um, that we're just sort of being consistent in how we're talking about groups in the rest of the ancient world. So that's why here I translate this as Judean, as Judeans. But I also want to, I also want to, um, uh, 
you know, kind of highlight the reason why there's many people who disagree with that and say, no, we should translate this as king of the Jews rather than king of the Judeans. Um, and that is that, of course, um, Jewish people still exist today. And um, the Jewish people who still exist today um, have real and meaningful ties to the Judeans of the first century. And so the argument goes that if you um, simply say, well, no, Eudaioi always means Judeans, well, then what you're doing there is you're erasing uh, Jewish people and perhaps Jewish voices um, from uh, from these from these texts, and I do think um, that that's a very very real real danger, which is why when it comes to translating Eudaioi, I am not one of those who says it's always Judeans in every instance. I think there are some um, instances where it it probably should be King of the Jews, uh, or or rather just Eudaioi as as Jews rather than Judeans. Um, I, I say King of the Judeans here because I think that this story is very ethno-political. And I think that especially drawing from Josephus's discussions of those tensions and the tensions that I see in the text, I think that Judeans better highlights that ethno-political tension. Yeah, yeah. So say hypothetically, if you were doing your, your own translation of, of the New Testament, there might be some times when you would translate the term as Judeans and sometimes you would translate the term as Jews, depending on the context. Yeah, absolutely. Depending on context, I think that, you know, it's one of the things that that is really important to realize with, with translation, really, of any text, or of any language, is, you know, translation uh, is not a game of finding the one-on-one -on -one correspondence. Um, you know, I mean, even the word and in Greek doesn't always mean and. It sometimes means but. And sometimes it doesn't need to be translated at all. So, you know, translation is one of those things, um, those ongoing discussions of is translation an art uh, or a science. And um, I mean, it's sort of a little bit of both, but um, but really with with especially with words like this that do kind of seem to have multiple senses, I think we have to be sensitive to context and say, you know, sometimes um, sometimes Judean, sometimes Jew, just like Ma uh, Magos, right? Sometimes um, <laughs> sometimes magician and sometimes wise man, right? And so you you know, you don't have many uh, translations of Matthew that follow the translations of Acts and say, and then um, in the days of Herod, uh, magicians from the East came to Bethlehem or whatever. They, you just don't really find that. Yeah. <laughs> this context matters, yeah. Yeah, so uh, New Testament uh, study students out there, religious study students, you're not going to be able to use GPT-3 auto-translation to oh, do your no. Greek homework. Oh, no, I haven't even thought about using that to translate yet, but... Uh... Maybe after we finish up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so coming back to these these questions of, of kingship, um, why would Matthew connect Jesus with David to, to make him a rightful king? And, and sorry, at the, at the end, it's, if, if we get a digression on Matthew's genealogy, which is part of the Christmas story and the number 14, just for no other reason that's neat as heck. So, so two questions yeah. there. Yeah, so neat. Well, and the genealogy is one of those things that, um, you know, when people are reading Matthew, um, in my experience uh, teaching undergraduates, when when my when I have my students read Matthew, nearly all of them skip the genealogy at the start because, I mean, let's be honest, genealogies are lists of names, and you don't want to sit down and read a phone book. So why would you read? Why would you sit down and read a genealogy? Um, but in this case, I think that the genealogy is actually really important. And for um, you know, there's a number of authors in the first century, Matthew's one of them, uh, Luke's another one, who who really, really want to connect um, Jesus with David. And so David as this kind of, you know, the, the, you know, the Lord's anointed, right? So, um, you know, the story of, uh, uh, of David kind of becoming the, the, I mean, David isn't really the first king, you know, Saul is the first king, but then David becomes the Lord's anointed. And so people who are following in David's line are also then the chosen anointed king. And so, and, and this, this word anointed, the Christos or the Mashiach, the Messiah. And so um, for, for Matthew, for Luke, this is a really, really important designation. And so connecting Jesus with David, another Messiah figure, another anointed figure is, is really important. Um, 
So one of the ways that, that both Matthew and Luke make this connection is by having Jesus born in Bethlehem. And that's that's really important because David, um, this is the city of David, and this is the city where David is 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 from. Um, but the other way, and I'll, now now we'll get into the genealogy, uh, that Matthew does this is is through is through his genealogy of uh, of of Jesus. And he, so he starts with with Abraham, which um, just sort of establishes Jesus's Jewishness. Um, you know, all Jews are are our descendants of Abraham. And so, you know, starting with Abraham doesn't really make Jesus unique. It makes him, uh, it gives him his sort of Jewish identity. But then Matthew traces um, Jesus's lineage through uh, David and then all of these Davidic kings and then all the way through um, there's, you know, the Babylonian exile and all this. But, but anyway, when Matthew ends his genealogy, he then gives you the key to interpreting it. And so what he does is he says, you know, there's um, th uh, three three different groups, 14 generations in each group. And then he repeats himself, so 14, 14, 14. And, and it, you're looking at this going, okay, we get it, 14. Well, what's, what's significant about the number 14? For you and me, probably not much, right? I mean, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the number 14. Um, you know, the number 13 might be unlucky, but what is the number 14 for Matthew? Well, the number 14 for Matthew is another way of echoing uh, uh, Jesus's Davidic heritage, because in um, uh, in the ancient world, in, in, in the languages and the kind of group, the, the area that we're speaking of right now, there's really not... Um, uh, uh, characters that are especially reserved for numbers. So in like Latin, we have Roman numerals, right? I, two I's, three I's, I and V. Um, and the same thing is true in Greek. The same thing is true in Hebrew. There's no Arabic numerals uh, yet. And so in these languages, every single alphabetical character has its own numerical value. So in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph is one, Beit is two, Gimel is, um, is three, etc. And if you if you use these um, if you if you if you um, uh, if you use these numbers and you kind of assign each of them or, or rather sorry if you use these letters and you assign each of them numbers um, then you can do things with names for example you can take your name and you can say oh the, num the numerical value of this name is is such and such and so you you see this in like ancient graffiti. Um, there's uh, some great examples from the city of Pompeii, which I'll, I'll paraphrase because I don't have to memorize, but there's great examples from Pompeii. You know, I love the woman whose number is 418 or something like yeah. this, right? Cool. And so, like, does that person who wrote that graffiti um, want any, just anyone to know exactly who he, he or she loves? Well, no, but does that person want the person that they love to know, right? It's sort of an inside, an insider code there. Well, um, the number 14 is very well known in Hebrew as being the numerical value of David's name, Dalit, Vav, Dalit, four, six, and four. And so when, when Matthew kind of reveals this and says, you know, I've structured this genealogy around the number 14, you know, it's oh, 14, David, David, David. But if that's not enough, David's name is also the 14th name in the genealogy. <laughs> so it's all just like piling and snowballing and sort, sort of like, Thank you. Subtle as a sledgehammer, right? And so Matthew, from the very beginning, basically is screaming at his readers, this is a story about David and and really about David's heir, who is who has now been born in Bethlehem and now there's Magi. Yeah. And uh, people, if you find secret codes in the Bible, make sure to email Dr. Van Den Eichel of all the secret oh, codes that you find. Absolutely. I yeah. love getting I love getting emails about secret codes. And also, you can double check me on all of this. This is not crazy Bible code yeah. stuff. This is actually real. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it strikes me, too, that and again, I know we're not really talking about about. Uh, well, we are sort of talking about some historical stuff since, you know, Herod was a historical person. But, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus being a descendant of David isn't that unlikely, because I remember one time my wife told me, you know, my family's descended from Charlemagne. and I, I didn't have the heart to tell her, well, you know, a couple million people in Europe are, are descended from Charlemagne. And it's something like a fifth of the world is descended from Genghis Khan. Right. You can really you can really trace back a lot of a lot, you know, if you go back far enough. So. <laughs> 
right. perhaps, perhaps it's a historical fact that David right. was an ancestor of the historical Jesus at you know some point. That's it. Well, and if you go back even with like genetics and stuff, and they say you know the most recent common um, ancestors that that all humans share um, aren't as far back as people suspect they are. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, precisely. Yeah, precisely. So, so continuing on, mm -hmm. I, I think this is going to really surprise some people. Uh, maybe as much as the number fourteen, but but the famous star that the Magi follow, like, mm -hmm. oh, what do stars have to do with kingship? Stars have everything to do with kingship, um, and that is a that's a really um, in, in biblical scholarship not so much overlooked, but I think that it is very very much overlooked in kind of common. Uh, understandings of the Magi story, um, you know, this idea that that this mysterious kind of um, heavenly orb appears and that the Magi don't know what it is. And so they follow it or they, you know, they, or, 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 or even they, they know what it is and then they still kind of follow it and, and uh, you know, portraying this as some sort of unique event when in fact, um, Matthew is tapping into a really, really well-known reservoir of material here. And so he is tapping into, for example, um, and there's also there's at least, a, at least a, the two references that I can think of off the top of my head that I talk about in the book are um, from Isaiah, right, where where Isaiah is taunting the king of Babylon, and you know God says to him, "Take up this taunt about uh, uh, um, against the king of Babylon, O oh, you who are fallen day star, son of the morning." Right, and so this idea of a falling uh, a falling star. Well, this is this is Isaiah saying to the king. You know, this is your star and you're falling, meaning your reign is coming to an end. Um, before Isaiah, though, in the book of Numbers, there's a prophet named Balaam who has this this oracle where he talks about a star rising up out of Israel. And, and here he's very much referring to either a kingly figure or some sort of military ruler. But in the in the Hebrew Bible, you have this kind of um, this tradition associated with, you know, when you know new rulers have these stars, you know they're symbolized by rising stars, and then also um, rulers who have fallen out of favor or or who are exiting power or whatever have falling stars or or dimming stars, whatever it is. Um, and you get this outside of the Hebrew Bible as well. Um, a great example that I do that I discuss in one of the chapters is the Star of Caesar, um, or sometimes called the Julian Comet, and this is the the comet that appears um, in the sky. A few months after Julius Caesar is assassinated, and this is this is one of those. Um, speaking of history, this is one of those events that we think probably did happen. There's Roman sources that talk about it, and there's also seems to be Chinese sources that talk about a similar kind of astronomical event around this time. And um, so there was apparently just this this very bright comet or some kind of you know whatever, and that was interpreted as a sign that. Um, Julius Caesar had ascended to the heavens and become uh, a god, become uh, deified. And um, and that star then starts to appear on Roman coinage. And the and so there's, you know, Mark Antony puts the star on his coin. Um, very famously, um, Caesar's son Octavian um, puts puts the star on the back of uh, of his uh, of some of his coins with the with the with the label Divus Julius, Divine Julius, because if Julius Caesar is is a is a is a kind of god, well then that makes anyone who is kind of in his lineage the son of a god and the and the legitimate kind of king of king of Rome or emperor of Rome, and so when Matthew tells the story about the Magi seeing a star and rising. That sort of participating in that rhetoric of, oh, the star is rising, there's a new legitimate king in town. Yeah. 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 And, and within the context of the story, when they're telling Herod, right, like, you know, we saw we saw the star, like Herod knows what that means. At least the character of Herod knows what that means right away. Well, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people miss is when they come and they say, where's the one born king of the Judeans? Because remember, Herod's not born king of the Judeans. He's made king of the Judeans by Rome. And so when they come and they say, where is the one born king of the Judeans? Herod doesn't say, oh, that's me or that's one of my kids. Herod says, Herod looks at his advisors and he goes, where is the Messiah to be born? So he is essentially saying, well, it ain't me. So let's find out where he is, right? Let's find out where he's supposed to be born. Cause, cause he does even, even Herod in this story acknowledges the power of that symbol. Well, there's a new star rising mean, meaning my kingship is coming to an end. Yeah. So the, um, the Magi bring, uh, they bring 
gold, frankincense, and oh wait, there's myrrh. And two, <laughs> wait, do, do you make that joke in class? Your students get it because I'm like, do young people know what an infomercial is? <laughs> um, you know, I I have uh, I have learned that puns. Um, it, it really does depend on the audience. Um, and 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 my students, there tends to be. Um, uh, there tends to be a bit of silence when I make jokes like that in class, but then there will always be a few nods like, I understand. And I just kind of, you know, I, I don't, I don't hold that against anyone, but yeah, I think uh, infomercials are, uh, yeah. Who yeah. even watches those things anymore? Yeah. So if you want an A for participation in Dr. Van and Eichel's class, make sure to laugh at those jokes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't even have to be amused. You just have to act like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, uh, the the three gifts of the Magi, uh, how could these be connected to kingship? Yeah. So there's um, there's a there's a couple of different ways to understand these gifts, and um, one the, the the traditional way to understand them, which is a, a very early tradition. I don't necessarily think it's Matthew's understanding, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, the, one of the traditional ways of understanding them is that the gifts are are supposed to symbolize something about Jesus's identity, about about who he actually is, or about um, or about who he's going to be. So if you think about this as you know when, um, you know when you've got a new a new baby and people buy them you know weird gifts like you know this you got a new baby boy and you know grandpa brings them a football or whatever like. <laughs> What am I going to do with this? Well, I mean, maybe one day you'll use it to to become a whatever you know, quarterback, or whatever. Um, so, so the argument has been made that these gifts are doing something like that with Jesus, and so the gold uh, symbolizing Jesus's kingship, um, the incense or the frankincense symbolizing Jesus's divinity, or I've heard it said also his priestly kind of status. And so Jesus, you know, in the Book of Hebrews, Jesus is called a kind of high priest priests use incense. Um, and then also, um, then the myrrh, uh, presumably meant to, um, symbolize Jesus's humanity or his death. And this is coming from this understanding of myrrh as a spice, uh, or an ointment that's used in burials. And so myrrh is, I mean, myrrh is a spice, but it's not just used in burials, but, um, so that's the kind of, that's one of the standard interpretations is that these gifts have a kind of symbolic loadedness. Um, and so a lot of readers, I think, bring that to the text. In my reading of it, um, I don't think Matthew actually has any of those things on his radar. I think Matthew sees these gifts as really expensive. Um, with, with incense and myrrh, I think he sees them as kind of exotic. Um, but really they're just, they're just expensive in, in, again, in my read, they're expensive gifts that are hard to come by. And so, um, if you are going to go and visit a new King and you're going to bring that King, you know, tribute or, or bring them gifts, uh, you need those gifts to be not things that just anyone could get. Like, why would you show up to give a King an iTunes gift card or something like that, right? It needs to be a little bit more impressive than that. Um, so, so you know, gold, frankincense, and myrrh are three substances that are characteristically hard to come by. Yeah. Um, so the Magi themselves, do, do they have a connection to, to being around kings? Yes. Um, in the, the best example of this, I mean, there's there's a couple. In, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, or rather, in, in the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, in the book of Daniel, uh, there are magi in Babylon who are called after the king of Babylon has a dream, and he calls magi along with a couple of other groups to try and understand what that um, dream is about. In uh, the book of Daniel, there's also the story of uh, the, the hand that shows up and writes the words of warning on the wall. In, and in Josephus's version of that story, uh, the king calls Magi to, to interpret that vision. Um, and so in, th in those cases, they're sort of advisory figures to kings. Um, but m even more prominently and more dramatically in um, in the works of Herodotus, the Greek historian, several hundred years before Matthew, Herodotus tells all these stories about like the Persian king Cyrus and other other kind of kings of Persia, where the Magi are advisory figures, they're interpreting dreams, they're interpreting visions, and they're also um, just kind of strangely present when kings are sort of rising and falling in one story. 
um, one of the Magi actually becomes a king and sort of <laughs> like like deceives his way into into the into the throne. And so um, in in all of the ancient literature, though, that I looked at, um, Magi really do have this very real connection. It's sort of almost like a magnetic pull. They are as as literary characters, they're sort of drawn to positions of power. And so um, there's almost a sense here that when um, when the Magi show up in Jerusalem, the reader is almost primed to understand, ooh, there's going to be a change of power here, which also might help explain why Matthew describes Herod and all of Jerusalem as being panicked when they show up. Magi come and they say, where's the one born of the king of the Judeans? And Herod and everyone loses their minds because when the Magi show up, there's going to be a shakeup. Right, right. So how can the story of the Magi in Matthew be understood as having anti-Judaic themes? This is something that you write about a, a fair amount in your book, and I was wondering if you can unpack that. Yeah, the anti-Judaism anti, anti is a... Um is a very, very unfortunate thread in interpretations of the Magi story. Um, I think, and I think this is a pretty, um, it's, it's rampant, it's very early, and it is also found in a lot of more recent books. I discussed in one in the last chapter, a children's book that has the kind of anti-Jewish um, themes in it as well. Um, I think that this so, so really at the heart of the anti-Jewish interpretation of the Magi is the idea that, well, who are the Magi? Well, they're Gentiles, they're non-Jews. And allowing the answer to simply stop there and to say, okay, you know, Matthew is describing Gentiles coming from the East. And um, the idea being that, well, the Gentiles want to come and worship Jesus and Herod and the rest of the residents of Jerusalem, the Jews, don't. They just want to kill him. All right. And so that kind of gives rise, I think, to this sense of like the good Gentiles and the evil Jews. Now, is there a chance that this is what Matthew's after? I mean, maybe, but I really think that his story is so much more complicated than that. But I think that we get to that. I think that we get to that interpretation when we lose sight of the complexity of the word Magoi. And what is Matthew actually saying here? And, and so if Matthew was describing, if Matthew's goal was to say non-Jews came from the East, there are so many more like nuance. Well, it's really not even not. There are so many more simple ways to have said that. He could have said people from the East. He could have also said like Gentiles, if that's what he meant, he could have said that. But instead, he picks this super, super loaded term. And it's not the case that all Magi are Gentiles. I mean, you've got um, in um, in Acts, for example, one of the Magi, one of the people described as a Magos, um, Bar-Jesus, is, is Jewish. And so, you know, it isn't the case that all Magi are Gentiles. And that interpretation of them just as Gentiles over and against those Jews and who just want to kill Jesus, I think that gives rise to this sort of anti-Jewish kind of polemic. And then I think that sort of takes off after you have Judaism and Christianity that kind of become, in a sense, two um, identifiable entities. This whole process is complicated, right? Do you have Christians in the first century? Eh, you know, but you do sort of start to get these two groups that that are moving away from each other and and Christians then sort of become antagonistic. And some and to some degree, there's a there's a mutual antagonism. But um, but I think the Magi become one of those really, really unfortunate pieces of that puzzle. And, they, and they're used to kind of intensify that rhetoric. Right, right. And in your book, you really lay it out how this interpretation arises, you know, fairly early, right, with mm -hmm. the church fathers. Very it's early, yeah. In, found in the Apophrica, which we'll talk about. And mm -hmm. then it's, it, it continues to literally, you know, like now to like modern interpretations and rewrites of the story. So mm -hmm. it, it really is, unfortunately, a, a powerful current in how people look at mm -hmm. this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, 
as I just mentioned, the story doesn't end with Matthew. Like, uh, what right. is Christian Apophrica? And, and I think people who watch and listen to the show probably know something about that. But, you know, this might be their first episode. And um, can you tell us some of the ways that, like, it expands their stories? Like, it gives them names. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can mention a text that gives them a backstory. I understand sure. that there's text that gives them a sequel. So right. it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like, you know, the modern movies, they always have, you know, they, they always have prequels and sequels now. So the Apophrica kind of does that for these these characters. So if you could kind of unpack that a little bit, and I swear yeah. I'll stop saying unpack. So go yeah, on. yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, uh, well, so maybe you could say uncover because that's yeah. the uh, you know the 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 apocrypha literally just means the hidden, and so um, so we'll, we'll sort of uncover. So apocrypha is a very very broad. Um, a, a very, very broad label that we use to just talk about um, stories that are sort of biblical in the sense that they're kind of um, imitating genres that we find in in the in the New Testament. They're just just talking about Christian apocrypha here. There's Jewish Jewish apocrypha as well, but um, Christian apocrypha we have apocryphal acts we have um, apocryphal gospels we have apocryphal letters and all of these things are kind of self-consciously styled um you know after these other these other examples and so um so with the um with the magi you get a really really fascinating collection of apocryphal literature and um one of the goals of apocryphal authors i mean just like just like authors who rewrite stories and if we think about um there's a whole kind of hornet's nest around the idea of fan fiction but if you're familiar with fan fiction that's very much um very very similar to how a lot of apocryphal authors are are treating their subject matter so they have a text a story um and that story maybe has some holes in it. So like Matthew's story has all sorts of holes in it. You know, Magi come from the East. Okay, well, where where exactly is the East? What does that mean? Um, are they good Magi? Are they bad Magi? Um, they're following the, uh, a star. What is the star? You know, why why are they interested in Jesus? All of the, and, and what are their names? Like what are all of these questions? Well, um, in apocryphal literature, these questions start to get answered and these authors um, these authors retell the story and they kind of fill in the gaps a little bit. And so it kind of starts off, um, it starts off pretty tame in the earlier texts. There's a, a text that I talk about that's very near and dear to my heart called the Proto Gospel of James. Mm -hmm. And in that text, um, you know, there, there's a, the, the question of, well, what was, what was unique about the star, right? Like that's, that's the question a lot of people, how, how did they know it was different? Well, in Matthew, they just kind of seem to know, but in the Proto Gospel of James, they come and they say, we saw his star and it was so bright that no other stars could be seen while it was shining. Okay, well, that's a, that's that author filling in that detail and saying, oh, they noticed the star because it was bright. Um, but then there's other texts that come later, fascinating Syriac text called The Revelation of the Magi that is just wild. Um, Brent Landau at the University of Texas has um, has a has an English translation of it, um, a, the first English translation, I believe, which is just wonderful. Um, and uh, in that text, there's not, you know, the traditional number of three, uh, three magi, which, I mean, there's a spoiler alert, Matthew never says three, but traditionally there's three. Um, but in the revelation of the magi, there's 12. And they have all these fancy, like exotic Syriac names and they live in a land called Sheer that's way off in the east on the edge of the world. And like all of these really, really cool details. And if you're reading the Revelation of the Magi, um, it's almost like reading um, like a Lord of the Rings sort of book. I mean, you, you have this kind of whole like lost culture and like all of these rituals and all of the, you know, whatever. But, um, but the Revelation of the Magi, the text itself is longer than the entire Gospel of Matthew. Yeah. And it's told f exclusively from the perspective of the Magi. And so they're the ones saying, we saw the star, we did this, we did this, we did this. And that author is, is kind of toying with this idea of like, what would the Magi story look like if they were the ones who told it? Yeah, it's just really fascinating. Yeah. And uh, in, in some of this material, you know, something that I was kind of surprised about is, is, there's, sometimes they're ambivalent figures, right? Like sometimes they're not always always positive. Can can you talk about that? Yeah, well, and at the very least, you know, sometimes they're not always positive. I don't really think they're ever really negative, but at the very least, they could be sort of um, just no neutral, perhaps, you know. And so a great example of this is another apocryphal text called um, 
the Armenian gospel of the infancy. Um, and in the Armenian gospel of the infancy, I mean, they sort of go back and forth. You sort of think that they're good, but then, and they, and they, they're, and they know that they're there to, they, they're there to deliver this kind of secret document um, to Jesus. And so they're sort of admirable figures, but they're also kind of shadowy, like they can't really get too close. They can't really know what's on the document that they're revealing to Jesus because they're eventually going to betray him or something like this. So they're kind of, um, in, in some of these texts, they do kind of preserve that mystery of who were the Magi. And I think Matthew considers them to be largely positive characters, but also, I mean, they, you know, they, they, they show up, they do their thing, and then they disappear as quickly as they, um, as quickly as they showed up. So are they positive figures or are they just functional in many ways? Like, are they just there to play a role? Um, you know, and so, and so in some texts, they kind of retain that mystery, whereas in other texts, they become almost like, you know, uh, Christian converts, like they, in the patristic literature, they talk about these, these figures as, you know, coming to Bethlehem for spiritual liberation and to become good followers of, of God and to be like, you know, exercised and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and sorry, I didn't put this in the question sheet, so, so I hope we can chat about it. But mm -hmm. uh, the, the links with the, with the Magi and the, the religion, I think, now known as Zoroastrianism or Mazdaism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a, a, a bit about, you know, why why people make this this connection? Um, and, and I see it in, in the modern day, too. Right. Like I, I see sort of positive posts being like this is this is one of the first interfaith connections. Right. Um, yeah. 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 So it, 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 is it possible to talk about that a bit? Yeah. And I do a little bit with Zoroastrianism in this book, but not really much because I don't yeah. I don't think that, um, you know, I don't think that that's really a connection that's super on Matthew's mind. I think Matthew probably is aware of Zoroastrians um, because they're not a insignificant group in the ancient world. But um I think the reason why there has been that connection in biblical scholarship before of like these are Zoroastrian priests or whatever. And then that that does persist in modern uh, literature as well as as modern scholarship. Um, and I think there's I think there's a few reasons for that connection. I mean, first of all, there's a delicious connection between Zoroaster um, and and the star. So Zoroaster means like pure star. And so there's like, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. Um whether Matthew realizes that or not is another question, but um, but I think the real significance is that when you look at ancient Greek literature um, and you and you sort of comb through looking for references to people called Magi, um, a lot of them are Zoroastrians, and so um, so Zoroaster himself is called the first uh, Magos in one of the in 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 a, a I believe Strabo perhaps. Um, you have to check me on that. It's chapter three. <laughs> I can't remember. I can't remember my primary sources off the top of my head. But um, but no, uh, you know, Zoroaster himself is called the first um, uh, Magos, and there's lots and lots of stories about um, you know the Magi figures as being like you know priests who are associated with the Zoroastrian uh, religion. So I think that there is a kind of there's certainly legitimate connections to be had there. Um, in this book, I chose to emphasize that political nature more than that sort of nature, because I think that that is Matthew's primary interest. They don't really do anything. Um, they don't really do anything in the story that would suggest that Matthew's primary interest is is their religious function. Um, but no, I think that that connection is there and it's legitimate and um, something I would probably be ex interested in exploring in the future. Yeah, yeah, I know it's not really in the book, but I, I wanted to bring it up just as an excuse to to tell people to read the Adoration of the Magi. I'm sure you know that one because mm -hmm. it's got <laughs> it's got that it, it's got this wild scene where, and again, there's sort of ambivalent figures in in that book, but mm -hmm. it has this wild scene where uh, the baby Jesus breaks off a piece of the manger and it's stone, and he gives it to them, and they can't lift it; it's too heavy. And I think I think that eventually they're able to lift it, or uh, but at some point they're not able to carry it. Um, they're able to lift it; they don't recognize it worth so they throw it into a well and then it emits a light and a fire yeah. it explodes yeah it it's explodes. like it's just it's it crazy yeah. yeah yeah and and that's and that's re really with the with the zoroastrians as the kind of fire worshipers that sort of yeah. um you know so so there are there are really those those connections are 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 really really fascinating um but yeah i don't i don't make much of them i don't make much of them just because i think matthew's doing something else yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
Okay, uh, the, the, oh yes, some of the ways to remember an iconography, and mm -hmm. particularly some, something that, that, that I'm sort of fascinated by is, is why they appear in tombs, like in, in the iconography yeah. of tombs. Like, I mean, I get Jonah, but like, you know, why Magi? So if you can tell us a bit about the right. iconography and a bit about tombs. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that's the, that's the thing. I think a lot of people are often surprised to hear when you look at like early Christian funeral art, um, to see the characters that pop up the most. And it, I mean, really like number one, I think it number one is Jonah, which like makes perfect sense because Jonah is for early Christians, like a precursor to Jesus's resurrection and, you know, uh, you know, be getting spit out of the fish or whatever, like the fish is a, as a, as a, as something that saves Jonah from the chaos waters and whatever. But yeah, the Magi are everywhere. And um, there's a, there's a museum, one of the Vatican museums, um, there's all these uh, sarcophagus fragments that are just kind of up on the wall and you just stand there and there's there's the 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 magi on like every single one of them and they appear in the catacombs there's like some of the earliest christian frescoes are the magi and um interestingly in the catacombs in rome there's um there's three magi in some of the pictures there's two in some of the pictures and then there's four in in, in at least one of them which is just really interesting we'll save that for later but um but yeah why did they appear why do they appear in funeral art um I mean, honestly, at this point, your guess is probably as good as mine. Um, I'm, I, I'm inclined to think. I mean, obviously, they're they're there for a positive reason because people don't put things on caskets that are there as as an insult, right? So, I mean, unless unless you've got you know somebody's like designing your casket, and they're like, I'm going to get them, yeah, you know, you know, I'm going to I'm going to really get them this time, and and then you put some kind of insult on their casket. But you know, generally speaking, when when we put things on funeral monuments and caskets and these sorts of things, um, they're there uh, to be complimentary, or they're there as signs of hope or something like that. I think I read somewhere the suggestion that the magi in so much funeral art was an attempt to uh, say something about the generosity of the person being memorialized. And so, you know, the Magi's gifts, the Magi come, they travel a long way, they sacrifice, they, you know, um, they, they, they give these generous kinds of things as a way of somebody saying, you know, like the Magi, I too was generous. And like the Magi, I too tried to find Jesus or something like that, right? Um, so there's this idea that develops in the kind of patristic era of their generosity and of their journey, right? And, and this journey that's not only a physical journey, but a spiritual journey. And so the patristic authors very much make the Magi into paragons of uh, not only virtue, but conversion. And so they're sort of, you know, they're, 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 they're seeking Jesus, they're trying to find Jesus, and they're seeking a kind of conversion experience. And so if somebody puts the Magi on their coffin, perhaps they're saying about themselves, um, I too sought to be converted, or I too sought Jesus. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, folks, if, if you want to remember be remembered as generous after your death for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can go to patreon.com slash Gnostic and help us keep the show going. You know, do, you can do as little as, as a buck. You don't have to send us gold, incense, or myrrh. You can do uh, one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. And if you can't help us out financially, we completely understand. Uh, just tell people about the show, like and subscribe. Just literally take an episode, your favorite episode, which is probably going to be this one. Send it to someone that you know will dig it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're probably starting to get into wrap up time, but I think we got a, a couple more questions uh, in us, which is um, a big one. Why do they still fascinate us now? Mm. Well, yeah, that's I. You know, I think I think one of the reasons that we've been. I mean, one of the reasons that this book exists, and one of the reasons that um, people have been kind of painting them and writing about them and thinking about them and, um, you know, all of those things for 2000 years now um, is because of the lack of detail in Matthew's story. And, you know, I think Matthew, you know, Matthew gives, obviously Matthew had some sort of intention, right. Of, 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 of you know, telling the story, writing the story, however we frame that. Um, but he doesn't really give us too much. He doesn't tell us exactly why. He doesn't say, where do they come from? He doesn't say, um, you know, the Magi, namely, you know, and then tell us what he means by this. Um, so he gives, he gives us enough detail that we kind of have a sense of the story, but he doesn't give us enough detail that our imaginations are really satisfied, right? And so I think that 
very much why they still fascinate is that kind of fan fiction um, impulse. And again, I'm not using fan fiction as a hermeneutic here, but that, that kind of impulse to understand these characters who are who are important, but also who are not terribly complex in, in terms of their role in the story, right? Or, or, or rather, they're complex, but they're not explicit. Um, and so Matthew's story is a very indeterminate story. The, the, the best example of an indeterminate story that, um, that literature people use and the biblical scholars use as well is that story that's um, often falsely attributed to Ernest Hemingway, um, the six-word story, Baby Shoes for Sale, Never Worn. Well, um, what's the story behind that story, right? Baby, sh why are we selling these baby shoes? Is it a cobbler who makes shoes, or a, you know, a shoemaker who makes shoes and like has a sign in his front window, "Baby shoes for sale, never worn"? Um, is it a mother or a mother-in-law who buys baby who's who buys your new baby shoes like that they're never going <laughs> to wear because they can't walk? I don't know if you've got your, you know, if you you're you're uh, you've got uh, over overrun uh, baby shoes right now, but you know, baby shoes you get you have to get rid of a lot of baby shoes when you have a new baby because you get a lot of them in the uh, in the mail as gifts. Or is it somebody who bought baby shoes for a baby who didn't make it? Yeah. Different ways of telling these sto the story, right? And and that story kind of keeps people guessing because it gives the kind of framework, but it doesn't have any of the of the important details. And so I think Matthew's story. Um, kind of lends itself to that imaginative exercise of trying to figure out who these guys were, where did they come from, what were they interested in or whatever. But then as time goes on and then they become their own sort of thing and they become, there's this sort of cult of the Magi that develops, I think then it kind of snowballs and it just gets, it gets more and more interesting. And so I think they still fascinate today because um, that because there are so many different pictures of them and, you know, and mental pictures of them as well as kind of physical pictures of them. And they sort of keep people guessing. And when I present on this, um, on this text publicly, one of the things I always enjoy doing is reading the text at the start of the presentation and asking this, I ask everyone, I say, raise your hand. If there's a lot less there than you remember. Yeah. And they all raise, everyone raised their hand. They're like, I, I, I thought that story was a lot longer than it actually is. Like, it's really, really short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I already did a, a commercial, but folks, if you want to buy some baby shoes, Jonathan at GnosticWisdom.net, <laughs> as well as baby hats. I have about 30 baby hats that are not, are not going to be much, much good in about two months' time. So They grow so know. fast. Yeah, they grow so fast. <laughs> um, okay, the, the question I've been wanting to get to, but, you know, it's, it's the best question for the end, not a great mm -hmm. one to open with. But what are some of the more, quote-unquote, out there theories you found about the Magi, like, online or in your research? I mean, stuff like UFOs, aliens, time travelers mm. i mean i gotta say you know even outside of sort of online nuttiness like i was surprised to see the templars pop up in the 14th century uh uh text by john of hildesheim so mm -hmm. yeah can you tell us about some of the some of the uh the more out there uh stuff you discovered yeah um and there there is actually quite a bit uh out there that's that's a bit nutty um there are and the, the really funny thing that happens after um, after you write a book about the Magi is that I guess it sort of wrecks your algorithm a little bit because <laughs> like, um, and I don't know, th this actually started to happen even after the book had been published. I started getting more and more Amazon um, and, and maybe people are published self-publishing stuff around this time of year, but um, no, there's a lot of stuff out there about, um, you know, who were they? Uh, who were they really? There's and like one of the more tame ones, which is still a bit crazy and I'm not going to say any names because this is, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to um, offend anyone. But, uh, but one of the, one of the, you know, one of the books that I picked up early in my research is like, you know, the true, the, the quest of the Magi or something like that. And, and like the first paragraph of the book begins something like, you know, my quest for the Magi begins in the south of France. It's like, wow, really, really, that's where it begins, um, you know. And and so like, you know, tracing this idea of like the Magi as this kind of like Knights Templar esque secret brotherhood which is very very popular among um some sort of pseudo historians and conspiracy theorists as that they're yeah some kind some kind of yeah secret brotherhood um by far the most fun uh by by far the most fun are the ufo um the ufo theorists you know and there's sort of um yeah this sense that um uh that the magi were well i did i have encountered 
I don't know if I've encountered the time traveling one. If I, I have, I, I just for... made that up. But yeah, I... no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, that's certainly, uh, that's certainly, I, I, I would guarantee that it's out there because I've seen yeah. almost everything with relation I, to the Magi. I think the um, UFO one's almost kind of, you know, obvious, right? Well, yeah, and, and and the story lends itself very well to that because you know the. I think that the most natural or well, the most common way that Matthew's story is read is that the Magi are coming from the east and that they are following a star that is moving on before them. That's not what Matthew's story says. Matthew's story says we saw the star past tense in the east at its rising. And then we came here to Jerusalem seeking the one born king of the Judeans. So they saw the star and then the star sends them to Jerusalem, but doesn't lead them to Jerusalem. Um, but anyway, the, the, but the kind of traditional way of seeing them is like, you know, they're on their camels trudging through the desert, you know, chasing after the star in front of them. And then, you know, if that's your read of it, well, then what happens is that the star makes it to Jerusalem and then turns left to go to Bethlehem. Well, stars don't turn. And so all of a sudden you have like, well, if it didn't, if it's not a regular star, then it must be aliens, right? And so that's the kind of <laughs> that's the common uh the, the the very unfortunate common turn like this is something we can't understand therefore it must be aliens there's so much ufo stuff out there about the magi and there's so much other just really really bizarre stuff um and a lot of it again i found after uh after this book was finished a lot of the weirder stuff so one of these days um maybe an updated edition with another chapter at the end <laughs> awesome awesome well folks uh the, don't don't wait for the updated edition you know get both <laughs> run out and get the, the magi It'll be who, years yeah. <laughs> yeah who they were how they've been remembered why they still fascinate and, and you mentioned another book that came out around the same time if, if you want to plug that as well yeah there's another book um that was published um uh, i think a week before this one officially in october it's an, a co-edited volume i did with uh, my colleague christy cobb at the university of denver um and it is called sex violence and early christian texts um by lexington books and um, so it's another another interesting a, a very very different subject matter but uh, another another volume that uh, that i'm very proud of and that my co-editor i'm very proud of yeah, and actually, we should plug a future release. A uh, uh, friend of the show, Dr. Meredith Warren, uh, you and her are collaborating on, on a book. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, Meredith Warren and uh, and I and then our, our colleague Sarah Rollins are working on a book right now, an, another co-edited uh, project, uh, a big one called Judeophobia and the New Testament. Um, Contexts, Texts, and Pedagogy, I think is the subtitle. And that'll be published with Erdman's. Um, and we're currently in the kind of editing phase right now, kind of trying to get these chapters um, uh, wrangled and um, hoping, fingers crossed, for a publication next year. But um, but uh, yeah, we'll look for that as well. And uh, yeah, something we're working hard on. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you'll come on uh, again uh, next Christmas season so you can talk to us about the, the proto-gospel of James because that's a really fun text. And I, I know yeah. you've done a, a lot of work on that. And yeah. you talk about uh, outdated references. You know, we can talk about uh, the Matrix time freeze uh, that's in that book. Um, I'm <laughs> yes. Always, I'm always talking to young people and being like, well, you know, the Gnostic myth could be understood by the Matrix. And they're like, the what now? Oh, that old movie? So anyways. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> okay, thanks so much, yeah. Dr. Van and Eichel. Farewell. Have a great epiphany. Good Thank night. you very much. You too. Bye.